Hello everyone, today we're going to be covering Alexander Dugan and the fourth political theory. Before we actually go into the work, I feel like it's appropriate if we spend a minute or so kind of delving into the uh, background and the biographical information of Alexander Dugan, just so um, you kind of you have a feel for what we're going to be getting into uh, going into this book. So Dugin is, um, he's a post-Soviet Russian intellectual. Uh, he's influential in fields like philosophy, sociology, international relations, theology, and other fields as well. He's a pretty um, well-diverse guy intellectually. He, he doesn't just do philosophy. He's mainly known for uh, his neo-Eurasianism. Eurasianism is um, an ideology, or Dugin doesn't call it an ideology, but rather an episteme. But uh, Eurasianism is this idea that Russia is unique as its own unique culture or civilization, and it's outside the West. Okay, uh, and Dugin himself is very anti-liberal, anti-West, and anti-America in general. He very much despises liberalism and Americanism in general. He, in his book, he has some uh, quite uh, great links he goes to to, de to denouncing all of those ideologies and ideas. Uh, he also seeks to create through his works in general, especially his philosophical works, to create a new Russian beginning for Russia, uh, especially for Russian philosophy. He wants to create a new foundation upon which Russian philosophy can grow from because he doesn't think that in its current state, Russia has ever had its own genuine philosophy. Rather, it's always been you know, influenced by other places so much that it doesn't have its own uniqueness to it. And he's very much against the idea that he calls archaeo-modernity. And this is a trend that he sees in Russia, especially uh, philosophically, where Russia tries to orient itself towards the West and Europe. But it also tries to orient itself towards uh, the Russian past, never really creating a, a, a future or having a new beginning. So Dugan is very much a Russian philosopher, a Russian intellectual, and he's an intellectual in the true sense of the word and that he actually has influence, at least uh, he's very much a public intellectual. He has influence uh, with a couple people in government. Uh, you might have seen some articles about Alexander Dugan, about how he's you know influencing Putin and some other stuff like that. And uh, with regards to that, he doesn't actually influence Putin that much because um, I saw an interview with uh, Dugan and he says that Putin is very much a, a realist when it comes to politics and Dugan is very much an ideologist. And I don't think Putin and Dugan actually talk that much anymore. Okay, so now let's go into an overview of what is the fourth political theory. So first and foremost, the fourth political theory is not a set of policies. It's not policy prescriptions that a nation should take or a city or, or whatever whatever political entity should take. That's not what it is. Rather, it's more heuristical than prescriptive in the same way that other ideologies of the past were. For instance, liberalism doesn't necessarily give um, policy prescriptions, but it gives you uh, basic premises and you can do policy upon those premises and adjust those accordingly to each uh, you know, nation, state, or country, or whatever it might, might be. The fourth political theory is also very much against globalization, westernism, liberalism, fascism, communism, modernism, the idea of infinite progress, or as um, some might like to say, the deep meme of the arrow of infinite progress. It's also against historicism, unipolarity in the geopolitical sense, and individualism. And I should note what he means exactly what he means here by um, liberalism, because that term, depending on where you're from, like Europe, America, or wherever, uh, liberalism has a very different meaning. There's several different uses of that word, um, and we're going to be using that word a lot here. But when, when we say liberalism, we mean liberalism in the Enlightenment sense. In the sense that, you know, both the Democrats and the Republicans in America are liberal. You know, they're both liberal parties. And in the sense that pretty much every European, with the maybe exception of like, you know, like very far Eastern European countries, uh, all those countries are also liberal. The idea of like human rights, um, you know, freedom from oppression of the government, things like that. Capitalism is another part of liberalism. That's what we mean by liberalism. Okay. So what is the fourth political theory in favor of? It's in favor of the ethnos, or the Volk. It's also in favor of collectivism, generally speaking. 
traditionalism and conservatism but as we'll see he doesn't mean conservatism in the sense of like a Mitch McConnell or Mitt Romney type uh, he has his own kind of definition that he brings out we'll, we'll talk about that later it's also for multipolarity civilizations being the subject of geopolitics the idea of time being reversible or like kind of like a social construct that we can create ourselves and it's also for Dasein, or sometimes he uses the Husserlian uh, uh, term, the transcendental subject or transcendental subjectivity, which we'll talk about more later. If you don't know what those terms mean, don't worry, we'll define that all later. I'm just kind of giving people an overview of what this lecture is going to be about. So this first section is going to be about time and the fourth political theory, because time plays a huge role in uh, Dugan's thought. And I have this quote here, this little epigraph that says, Globalization is the death of time. Globalization cancels out the transcendental subjectivity of Husserl or the Dasein of Heidegger. So, the fourth political theory in Dugan squarely rejects the deep meme of the arrow and of infinite progress. And they reject the idea of unidirectional time. The idea that time is always moving forward, that progress is always going. Uh, in the fourth political theory, time is a social construct, and we can see many societies that have a non-progressive view of time, a sense of time that us, many of us at least, who live under liberalism, um, might have a hard time understanding exactly. So he gives a couple examples of different variations of non-unidirectional time. There's um, cyclical time, there's regressive time, uh, messianic time. And as Chad Haig has noted, that there's also a stagnant time. Dugan elaborates with a quote here. He says, quote, Time's structures do not depend upon their objectives, but upon the dom domination of social paradigms because the object is assigned by society itself. What Dugan means here is that time is a creation of society um, and that time isn't just something that always is one way because humans actually have... Uh, an ability to control time in a way he, he gets a little more nu nuanced with it but we'll talk about that later um, but time is ultimately a function of Dasein or transcendental subjectivity which gives us freedom to choose how we view time for Dugan uh, it should be noted Dasein is multipolar not universal this is something that Dugan is um it's one of his main philosophical projects that he says he's undertaking is that he's showing that the um, the Dasein of Heidegger is actually not universal but it's multipolar it has multiple different uh, instantiations in each society or each um uh, civilization or something along those lines and because time is a function of design or society monotonic processes must also be rejected um so monotonic just means always going in one direction so the idea of time always moving forward has to also be rejected and he gives an interesting example of the American, the Native American uh, potlack, which is um, a tradition that Native Americans in the kind of like the northwest part of America or like a, I guess, southwest part of Canada do, where they basically have a, um, a, they have a community gathering or it's a celebration, and they basically destroy their excess wealth um, because they don't have a unidirectional view of time and progress. And Canada uh, has actually banned this process from like the 1800s all the way up until 1951 rather than having a view of a unidirectional time the fourth political theory is rooted in quote the direction of balance adaptability and harmony instead of desiring to move upward and forward we must adapt to that which exists to understand where we are and to harmonize socio-political processes life is more important than growth and Dugan is against all modernist ideologies, like liberalism, communism, and fascism, because they all have a monotonic view of progress and of time. Uh, he says that actually Hegel is the godfather of all modern ideologies with his concept of history and ever-moving progress and time and a geist. Under liberal capitalism, we see this come true with the social Darwinists and also people like Ayn Rand and Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan, if you, uh, for those of you who weren't aware, was actually the chair of the Federal Reserve for some time 
uh, back in the early 2000s, I believe, and he was actually a student of Ayn Rand, and he was actually a very influential student of Ayn Rand and helped with the early objectivist movement, like such as publishing newsletters and even writing a few chapters in a couple of her books as well. Um, but under the Ayn Rand, Alan Greenspan view, those who are against infinite growth of capitalism are deemed parasitical. And it seems to be for Rand something that's almost inherent in people to either be good or bad objectively. Uh, it's almost like a biological thing. People show no room for growth. If you ever read um, Atlas Shrugged, uh, you'll see that there's no really there's no character development really in any of the books. There's not even characters who go from bad to good and kind of like see the light. Everyone's either good or bad from the start and there's no um, nuance, there's no gray area. And another problem with liberal capitalism is that for Dugan, the problem is that a liberalism imposes itself across the globe. So it doesn't just stay within its nation states that adopted it, but rather it must imperialistically impose itself everywhere. You know, we see this through American foreign policy. Um, his criticism of Marxism uh, is that the Marxist dialectical materialism and its stages of history ultimately end with world communism. So it has a, a monotonic view of time in which time is always moving towards communism in some way or the other. And he says because uh, Marxism and liberal capitalism share the same view of time and of monotonic processes, that it's no surprise that we see Trotskyites who are, um, for those of you who don't know, they are a variation of Marxists who... Um, who are very much against um, the iterations of communism that we saw with like Stalinism, where um, Stalin took the uh, USSR under a policy of socialism in one country, where he used nationalism to kind of build up the Soviet Union, uh, because the Trotskyists want a world socialist revolution. Um, they're very much globalist in that sense of the word, and they're anti-nationalist also. Um, so it's no surprise that we saw a bunch of, you know, radical Trotskyites from the 60s and even earlier become some of the early 2000s and late 90s of Bush, uh, Bush Iraq war era, um, some of the largest neocons, people like Irving Kristol, James Burnham, and David Horowitz are all examples of the Trotskyite to neocon pipeline. And Dugan is also against fascism because he says fascism is uh, a racialized Nietzschean will to power view of history. And that it's also historicism. And in talking about Karl Popper, um, Karl Popper, who wrote the book, or actually volumes of books, called um, The Open Society and Its Enemies, which George Soros actually named his foundation, The Open Society, after Karl Popper, uh, in his books, uh, wrote very extensively against communism and fascism because he claimed that both of those ideologies are historicism. He you know, said their historicism and their evil and all that. He also, interestingly, in those books said that Plato is also a fascist as well. But anyways, Dugan is, is essentially saying to Popper, Popper, you need to look at what your own ideology of liberalism is because your ideology of liberalism is also a form of historicism as well. And now the question is, what can we glean? What can we learn from these modernist ideologies? The fourth political theory doesn't blindly negate all these ideologies of the past. And he, uh, Dugan says that there is good and there's bad about these ideologies. And we can learn something from all of them. So for communism, what's bad about communism for Dugan? The bad is that it has a sense of historicism about it, um, of moving towards a classless communist utopia. And he also says that the Marxists have failed to predict where communism would occur. So the classical uh, Marxist uh, definition or idea of where the revolution, the communist revolutions are going to take place is that they're going to take place in rich industrialized nations when um, in reality they only really occurred in a poor um, under industrialized nations. But there is something we can learn from communism and he says that what we can learn is we can learn from its sociological aspects of it. Um, the sociological aspects that talk about things like alienation and how capitalism gains and maintains its power and the, um, the critiques of capitalism that were given by communism that basically showed that liberalism is a totalitarian ideology and has flaws and it's not flawless in and of itself. So now moving on to fascism. What's bad about fascism? For Dugan, what he says is bad about fascism is that it is racist, and he says that it's racism 
ultimately led to its death because Hitler was so uh, racist that he hated Slavs and Russians, and this caused him to attack Russia in the Second World War, which made him, uh, you know, ultimately lose his ideology, his life, his country, and fascism was essentially uh, wiped off the face of the earth for the most part. But there is some good from fascism, he says. What's good about it is that we can learn something from its anti-individualism and the emphasis on the ethnos or the Volk, and which he defines as a culture phenomena, a community of language, religious belief, daily life, and the sharing of resources and goals as an always unique means of establishing a relationship with the outside world. And now we have liberalism. So the bad about liberalism is that it's inherently expansionary, it's individualistic, and it's especially anti-ethnos. Dugan even uh, goes as far as to say that that liberalism commits ethnocide, as in it kills ethnosis. Um, we have a couple of quotes here from Dugan I want to read. First is, he says that man is anything but an individual. And he also says that the individual must be thrown off his pedestal. So Dugan is very much against the idea of the individual. That's something very core to his um, thought throughout the whole book, really. But what's good about liberalism? The good about liberalism, and he says this almost tongue-in-cheek, but the good is its idea of freedom. And he doesn't mean freedom in the classical liberal sense of the word of, you know, freedom from this or freedom to do this or something along those lines, like human rights or something like that. Rather, he takes the idea of freedom and he says we can use freedom in liberalism and give Dasein freedom. He says the freedom given by ethnocentrism and the freedom of Dasein. So that's what I mean by it's kind of tongue in cheek because he takes the freedom that's inherent in liberalism and then he applies it to collectivism, which uh, liberalism is inherently against. All right, let's move on to the next section against liberalism and America. The quote I got from uh, Dugan here is, Only a global crusade against the U.S., the West, globalization, and their political ideological expression, liberalism, is capable of becoming an adequate response. So how did liberalism conquer the world? So the 20th century is the main century that we'll be looking at here. Um, Dugan says that the 20th century was the century of ideology. He also paraphrases... Um, Irving Kristol, who says that the 20th century was the century of America, but the 21st century will be the American century. So before the 20th century, and actually during a lot of the 20th century and even afterwards, um, there wasn't ideology in the sense that we understand it today in a lot of the world. So you had, quote, religion, dynasties, estates, classes, and nation states played an enormous role in the lives of peoples and societies. So society wasn't so much based off of ideology, it was more based off kind of a pure power politics, if you will, or even religion or um, you know economics, states, dynasties, things like that. It didn't really have an ideological bend to them at all. So the first ideology that we see is the first political theory, also called the first position, which is liberalism which has as its um, historical subject individualism or the individual. And then you have the second political theory, which kind of arose out of, re out of response to liberalism, and that's communism or socialism, which has as its historical subject the class. And then finally we have the third position or political theory, fascism or national socialism, which um, for its historical subject either has the state as it, in the case of fascism, or at least uh, classical fascism, or under National Socialism, it's the race, at least under the German National Socialism was. So liberalism was left at the end of the 20th century as the sole ideology. World War I basically saw the destruction of any pre-ideology in the West, especially um, after World War I. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire fell into a republic and it became fairly liberal, uh, you also saw the collapse of the uh, Habsburg dynasty, which ruled much of Central Europe uh, right before uh, the end of World War I. Um, and then you also saw various other monarchies fall in Europe. And to the extent that monarchies existed after World War I, 
they were mostly just um, ceremonial in the sense that they didn't really have any power and it was actually um, a liberal democracy that ruled over them. And then, of course, in World War One, we also saw the, the Tsarist regime uh, be toppled by uh, communist revolutionaries like Lenin and them. And then World War Two, we saw the first position and the second position, so liberalism and communism, wipe fascism and national socialism off the earth as a ideology that is considered acceptable. Um, arguably, there are a few exceptions that popped up afterwards, um, but for the most part, it was taken off the earth after World War II. And then under the Cold War, we saw a fight between liberalism and communism. And at the end of the 20th century, we saw that liberalism had won, the West had won, and communism fell. And with this, liberalism was the only ideology that was left standing. But something interesting happened to liberalism after it basically became hegemonic. Um, ideological liberalism turned into this end of history, non-ideological post-liberalism. Dugan writes the following, he says, Having triumphed, liberalism disappears and turns into a different entity, into post-liberalism. And this post-liberalism is stripped of a political dimension and turned into the global market society. So rather than liberalism being um, another option, an another ideological option at the ideological buffet, liberalism is the only thing that's left. It becomes an existential fact. It becomes simply what is. And because liberalism becomes this, it undergoes a type of um, change in its essence. Um, and Dugan uh, continues, he says that, all other ideologies have failed to combat liberalism, and because fascism and communism failed to defeat liberalism, we need something else, and that is why he's creating the fourth position. The fourth position is designed to defeat liberalism. It's also designed to be against communism and fascism, but at its core, and what Dugan rails most about in his book is how much he despises liberalism and the evils of liberalism and post-liberalism. And that's mainly the inspiration for the fourth political theory. So with liberalism having conquered the West and the world at large, liberalism has become omnipotent. So the United States sees itself as the peak of Western civilization. We see this through ideologies like American exceptionalism. And he also points to uh, Manifest Destiny, which was a common ideology that was held during the 1800s in America, that America must expand westward and it must you know, get new land and territory and take in new states and all that. And by the 1990s, uh, as we stated earlier, America was the sole superpower, but it still continued expanding liberalism. Um, America tries to impose unipolarity across the world and punishes states who don't accept liberalism. Um, there was a time where America had a more pragmatic foreign policy where it could ally with you know, an illiberal like Stalin of the USSR against uh, their enemies. And it could also ally with other kind of petty uh, authoritarian states um, to attack their other enemies. Um, but now it's taken a different posture in which it um, it's pretty much pure ideological now it's always promoting liberalism and Dugan suspects that there's going to be a huge um kind of a cleavage between America and Saudi Arabia over ideology pretty soon but there is some debate amongst the American foreign policy elites um about uh how America should go about spreading liberalism um there's kind of the more um neocon republican version of unipolarity uh, or unilateral unipolarity where it's America goes in guns blazing um doesn't really care about like fostering um ties with other countries and creating alliances and things like that and then there's the more um liberal view of spread like liberal in the American political sense of spreading uh, America American liberalism and a uh, unipolarity which wants a more multilateral view of doing it where you involve like the UN or you know European allies or Australia or other countries but ultimately they all have the same goal it's just a debate about how we should reach world liberalism and uh, as we kind of stated in the slide beforehand um, liberalism transforms into this post-liberalism 
and it can no longer live side by side with other ideologies because it has transformed into an existential being where it simply is. It's simply that which is. You don't have another choice. You don't get to you know, choose if you want to live under communism or a traditionalist theo theo theocratic monarchy or fascism. You must accept liberalism. But also with this churn to liberalism, uh, to post-liberalism, you see that post-liberalism has started to turn more dystopic. Um, it's it starts to resemble more of a Guy Debord and John Bolgiard's worst nightmares. Um, if if you guys are familiar with those postmodernist philosophers, where they talk about like you know um, Bolgiard's um, most probably famous work is um, Simulacrum Simulation, and then uh, Debord. Uh, his main work is the society of the spectacle um where he talks about how um we live under a spectacular society in like the the worst sense of, of the word um and how we don't really have a, a choice the only choices that we have is which tv channel do we want to watch some stupid garbage on um and we have um fake culture we don't really have anything authentic it's just um media 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 uh, technology 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 and a kind of a pseudo culture but perhaps most fundamental about post-liberalism is that it lies to man and it tells him that you can't say no to it. And this is a huge lie for Dugan because um, he says that fundamentally we can say no to liberalism. Um, it's actually, it's almost a moral imperative that we do it and he's going to show us how and why we need to do that. He has a quote here and it says, However much liberalism today claims that there are no alternatives, there is always a choice in human history. While man exists, he is free to choose both what everyone chooses and what no one does. But before going into how we can say no, he first tells us why leftism can't say no to liberalism. And he says that leftism in the 21st century is under crisis. Uh, it doesn't really offer a genuine way to say no. Orthodox Marxists, he says, have been proven wrong and wrong again about things such as where communist revolutions are going to happen at, saying that the revolution is going to take place in industrialized nations when actually it takes place in relatively unindustrialized rural nations and rather poor nations at that. Um, and the social democrats lack any real intellectual rigor to them because it's just like Orthodox Marxism plus um, democracy or some weird combination that they haven't exactly figured out. And a problem with both the orthodox Marxist and the social democrats is that they haven't adopted their ideology to the 21st century essentially. They're still living in the, the 1800s and they haven't um, realized the new information economy that we have in the postmodern age that we lived in and they haven't really updated their critiques of liberalism and capitalism to meet uh, these new challenges. And then Dugan also categorizes another group of leftists, which he calls the left nationalist. And these are the people, or this is the ideology which ruled in China, North Korea, USSR, Albania, Cambodia, etc. during the 20th century. Um, and it's uh, and these left nationalism take communism and socialism, but they add a nationalist element to them, and a rather large nationalist element at that. Um, for instance, in North Korea, they have the ideology of Juche, which basically means um, self-reliance. And, uh, and under Stalin, it was communism or socialism in one country. And he very much tapped into um, patriotism and the Volk and the ethnos and the Russian people in order to get things done, such as um, win World War II. He had to appeal to um, patriotism and nationalism to um, give his troops morale. But the thing about these left nationalists, though, is that um, they don't recognize or they don't officially recognize what they're doing. They still say that they're orthodox Marxist. And because they still like lie to themselves or at least to the public that they're orthodox Marxist, they, they can't really um, create any ideology with any rigor to it. And because of this, um, it's of no use because it's just a it's just ad hoc, uh, incoherent ideology now. And then lastly, there is the new left, or the postmodern left, which Dugan says has many good tendencies to it. Um, he praises its anti-globalization, and also how they realize the brutality and the totalitarianism of capitalism better than the orthodox Marxist. 
But the problem with uh, these leftists is that they end up defending bourgeois society with their pseudo-environmentalism and their support for these really weird transgressive labor unions. Also, their support of things like gay rights and the abolishment of drug laws. And what happens with these people is that they essentially become stooges of capitalism or bourgeois society as a whole wherein they're allowed to have their critiques of capitalism of you know globalization and things like that but they're only really amplified their voices are only amplified when it comes to things like promoting gay rights or the abolishment of drug laws or some of uh, pseudo environmentalism which is just like bourgeois fantasy ideology and they just become another tool in the toolbox for uh, capitalism. And because of this, they don't really offer us a way that we can say no to liberalism because they've become part of the system. But where leftism has failed, he finds hope in conservatism and in traditionalism. And he doesn't mean conservatism in the American sense. He kind of has his own specific definition of it. So he has a term for people like Edmund Burke and Mitt Romney. Uh, he calls them um, liberal conservatives or status quo conservatives because they're not really against liberalism. Uh, he says that, they're, that they really have agreement with the general trends of modernity, but disagreements with its more avant-garde manifestations. He even quotes Edmund Burke, who wrote so much about um, the French Revolution and being against it. But... Really, his only critique of the French Revolution wasn't its goal, it's just how it did it. So his question is, what are you opposing then? You're just opposing a revolutionary method, but you're not necessarily against what the revolution was for. Actual conservatives, he says, repudiate the logic of modernity, and they are against the deep meme of infinite progress. He doesn't use those words exactly, but I'm paraphrasing here. Um... And he points to uh, three groups that he says can be useful to saying no to liberalism. The first are their traditionalists, uh, René Guénon, uh, Julius Savola, people like that. Um, people who reject the episteme of modernity as a whole. Then he also um, points to the religious fundamentalist as another example. Um, we have the Islamic vein of this, but we also have the Christian vein of this. And what's good about these groups is that they show it's possible to live a life outside liberalism or post-liberalism, if you will. Um, they show that you can live a, a, a very religious life where you don't really take into account what li what liberalism and the TV has to say. He even points to um, the old believers of the Orthodox, people who don't believe in technology really um, and who live very traditionalist lifestyles as people who have said no to liberalism as a way that we can break from this matrix. But lastly, the last group he has is the German conservative revolutionaries. Um, the people here are people like um, Ernst Jünger, uh, Karl Schmidt, Oswald Spengler, and uh, Martin Heidegger especially. These people don't simply want to slow down time or go back into time. They want to fundamentally uproot the system of modernity itself in a revolutionary fashion. And he actually says that in, in many ways that they're more radical and they pose a secular challenge to um, religious fundamentalists who simply want to return to an era that brought us to the modern day. Uh, he kind of likens the religious fundamentalist, although he says there is something that we can learn from them and possibly um, help us in our uh, quest to say no to liberalism. He says that fundamentally what they're doing is they're just reverting back to a time when the virus wasn't as deadly, when it hadn't manifested fully. But the German conservative revolutionaries recognize that we have to, you know, totally uproot the whole system itself. Then the problem becomes that even if we can, you know, break from liberalism and we can go another way, liberalism, as we stated, is so imposing. It's omnipotent. It's everywhere. It has the, you know, the might of the whole United States military and NATO at its back, you know, nuclear weapons as well. So how do we do anything against this? So Dugan starts looking at states that don't like American domination. And, and there's a lot of states, there's a lot of countries in the world that don't like liberalism or aspects of the West or Americanism. But to some degree, they accept it mainly because they want to protect their sovereignty. They want to say, OK, fine, you know, we'll import Hollywood movies, but, you know, allow us to, you know, still have our elections and, you know, don't interfere in our elections and whatnot. Right. Um, but these states who are opposed to Americanism are largely reactive. 
and they're not aligned with other states. They're just individual actors acting in a very reactive manner. But liberalism doesn't act that way. Liberalism in the United States is a global strategy. And it's a global strategy that is backed by an ideology as well, it has an overcompassing um, view, has an overcompassing strategy of how it's going to go about things. And therefore, you can't fight this with just mere reactionaryism. You have to fight this with also a global strategy and ideology even. And he says the inklings of this are sprouting up in anti-liberal ideologies across the world. Uh, he points to Eurasianism. Uh, there's also movements in some places to have a an Islamic union or an Arabic union. And also in South America, there's kind of a push to have a, a Bolivarian union as well that can um, you know help fight America and Americanism. Um, but the problem with these ideologies, though, is that they lack any state power. They don't have state backing, for the most part, at least. Um, but the problem with nations and nation states is that they lack any ideology to help fight against liberalism. So there's a bridge. There's a gap between these two, and we have to amend um, this if we want to be able to effectively um, be able to counteract um, the West and Americanism. And the way Dugan presents the way to do this is through civilizations being the subject of geopolitics. So what does he mean by civilization? He does not mean civilization in the sense of the Enlightenment where, you know, we're going to bring civilization to the savages or to colonies or something like that. Uh, he actually thinks that um, civilizations are actually rather barbaric in a sense that rather than civilizations being a um, step beyond barbarity and savagery, civilizations act side by side with those things. Um, he gives a quote here of what he means as his definition of civilizations. He says, Civilizations designate wide and stable geographical and cultural zones, united by approximately common spiritual, moral, stylistic, and psychological arrangements and historical experiences. So there's a two-pronged reason why he um, promotes the idea of civilizations as being the subject of geopolitics. The first is a moral reason, which we kind of talked about already, how... Um, Civilizations can bridge the gap between state power and ideology and be an effective fighting force against um, globalization of the, of the West. But there's also um, a sort of realism where he says that the world is kind of already going in this direction. And he cites Samuel Huntington uh, in his thesis of the clash of civilizations where Huntington basically says that in the post-Cold War era, nation states are becoming less and less um useful and less and less important and broader large spaces civilizations or civilizational states uh you know things like china and india and uh, arguably russia for dugan um those are becoming more important than individual states such as something like armenia um, portugal norway or something like that and another important factor about these civilizations is that each civilization would be able to be one pole in a multipolar world and we wouldn't have a unipolar world dominated by just one civilization as we do now with the, the West um, pretty much dominating the whole entire world. So I want to end this um, section here with a quote from Dugan. He says, quote, the most important thing is that a multipolar world emerging in such an instance will create the real preconditions for the continuation of the political history of mankind. And as much it will normatively affirm a variety of socio-political, religious, moral, economic, and cultural systems. Otherwise, simple and sporadic opposition to globalism on a local level or on behalf of an ideologically amorphous mass of anti-globalists, and that is the best case, will only postpone this end, and it will put the brakes on its onset, but it will no longer become a real alternative. All right, so this next section is going to be about the existential threat that liberalism poses upon humans, upon our Dasein, if you will. So first, let's go into some definitions. So uh, the first definition I want to give is ontology, because I think we use this a few times in the future. Ontology just means the branch of metaphysics that has to do with being. Then we have a transcendental subjectivity. So uh, Dukin uh, gives a definition here. He says, according to Husserl, the foundation of all consciousness is transcendental subjectivity. 
from whence it conceives itself as a, as a kind of short circuit. This experience is self-referential. -refer In it, there is the perception of pure being as the presence of the subjectivity of consciousness. Then we have Dasein, which literally in German means being there. Uh, it means like existence or a, or a presence. Um, it's that which constitutes human existence itself. And there's different levels of authentic being or authentic Dasein. Um, and in general, in this um, part of the book, Dugan uh, uses Dasein and transcendental subjectivity as interchangeably meaning something like the, the true hu human spirit or like um, what really constitutes being a human. So uh, with Dugan's conception of time, he sees the past, the present, and the future as all three being ecstasies of time. Um, and he says that they're all three uh, equally ontologically um, provable. So, for instance, the future is not written in stone, and it's not guaranteed to happen. The present, um, and here he cites Kant, uh, saying that just because we perceive something doesn't mean that it's actually happening. And with regards to the past, the past is also put into doubt because we understand the past through historical record, and that is subject to forgery and misunderstanding. So, what Dugan is trying to say here is he's trying to say that the, the, the components that make up time, the future, the present, and the past, they can all be put into doubt in a certain way. Um, and this makes them all equal with each other, all uh, equal ontologically speaking at least. And what this means is that we can de-emphasize the ontological provability of the present and we can put more um, proof or more emphasis on the past and the future. Uh, as we mentioned at the start of this lecture, time for Dugan is a social construct. The transcendental subject, or Dasein, quote, instills time in the perception of the object. And here, uh, Dugan gives several examples of different views of time uh, as proof of this uh, subjectivity of time or uh, relativity of time. Uh, he brings up cyclical views of time, uh, traditional views of time, which always looks to the past to understand the future. Then there's a stagnant view of time. Uh, and then there's the messianic view of time, which always looks to the future, like one specific event, event in the future to explain the present and the past. And then our, the liberal view of time is the materialistic view of time. Dugan says, uh, following uh, Husserl and what Husserl said about time, that time should be understood like music. Um, for instance, we don't just hear one single note of a song, right? We don't just hear like um, one chord or one note. We hear the past in that note as well. Like when we listen to a song or listen to music, we listen to the current note with reference to the past, but we also listen to the present note, which is referencing the past as well with reference to the future as well. Um, an obvious example of this would be considering like a drop in music, right? Like we, we anticipate the drop. We anticipate something in the future. Um, and if we consider time as only listening to one note, it doesn't make sense if we just think of time as something that's in the present, when actually time is all those things combined, and we experience the past, present, and future all at the same time. He has a quote here that says, The past is present in the present. The present thus becomes continuous and includes the past as a vanishing presence. And Dugan actually spends quite a bit of time uh, talking about how the future relates to the past, the past relates to the future, the, and the present and all that. He has a very, um, he kind of explains how all these uh, modes of time are interconnected with each other and rely on each other as well. So the future is that which ushers out the present, it, but it, the future is always with the present. He says, the future is the process of the death of the present. Um, but he also makes sure to note to say that the past is not um, equal to history. History, he says, is awareness of the presence of the past and the present. So what does this mean? It means that history is our relationship with the past and something that uh, another philosopher Francis Parker Yockey says he says that um, he agrees with this statement he actually wrote uh, his ideas in like 1948 he agrees with this statement and he says that since history or sorry since the present is always changing that means that history is always changing because our relationship with the past is um, changing because our present is changing 
And continuing with this line of reasoning, the world around us is the way it is because of presencing. Um, Duke actually goes quite in depth about how our consciousness or our subconsciousness creates time and why it has to create time. He, uh, It's a rather short section of Dugan's writing, but is it is rather dense, and we're going to skip over a lot of it just for the sake of time and brevity. I know this is already going on quite long, um, but humans, uh, through the manifestation of subjectivity, create time, and time is what creates the world. So humans or Dasein or the transcendental subject manifest. It doesn't create time. It's, it's a bit nuanced. It doesn't create time. It manifests. It's just something that happens. And this is why um, Dugan argues that reality lacks presence during sleep because we're not presencing anything. We're not presencing reality with time. We're not ma- mixing temporality with um, the uh, object world while we sleep. It's only the, the dreams that we're thinking of. So thus, the future uh, of something is absolutely subjective in nature, and the future of something is also solely a social concept. But things can only have a future if they're within the human context, though, because time is a social concept. Therefore, things like rocks and other inanimate objects don't have a future because they're not part of the human context. But time is something that is very innate. To human beings. It's something very innate to Dasein and transcendental subjectivity. It's a very defining thing about us. Dugan even goes as far as, as far as to say that time is man's ultimate identity. Man cannot not think about time. We're always thinking about time. We're always presencing unless we're asleep, but even then you can argue dreams and all that. But we're always thinking about time. Time is never not a part of us. And as we stated earlier, the past, the present, and the future are all connected. And even if, let's say, we have a social constructive view of the future, like with a messianic time, maybe something like um, if Christians waiting for the second coming, or uh, Jews waiting for like the first coming, or some type of apocalypse that's supposed to happen in the future into the world, or, or something like that. We have a messianic view of time. Even if those future events never happen, in in a real sense of the term, like, uh, you know, Jesus never comes, the first Messiah never comes, the doomsday never comes, even if those never come and and they never will happen, that socially constructed future still helps to explain the past and the present, at least for that society. And uh, that's something Dugan is very big on. He's like, each society has its own construction of time and understanding a society, it's very important that we understand its time because once we understand a society's time we can in a sense predict how a society will unfold of course there's going to be um you know like things we can't control for like maybe natural disasters famine plagues wars you know things like that that are unforeseen but in general if we understand a society's time that truly allows us to understand a society that's why dugan is able to um at least he would argue that's why dugan is able to Uh, project the future of liberalism and what it's going to do because he understands the liberal perception of time and another important thing to note about uh, his reasoning is that we experience time in its totality you know kind of as i said with the music notes right we don't just listen to one note of a song we think about the past notes of a song and the future we anticipate the next note almost we anticipate the next uh, lyric or the next verse or chorus and because of this um, multipolar view of time, where each time is different for each society, and therefore there can be no um, collective future of humanity because each person's view of time is different. And thus, if a society wants a future, it must be its own future that is formed through their own collective consciousness. They must have their own authentic view of time to have their own future. Um, and this is why, arguably, um, and this is kind of me extrapolating here, why things like mythology, origin stories, and mythical dynasties, like the Xia dynasty of China, which is um, um, an apocryphal or kind of a made-up dynasty, were created in these uh, early civilizations and early societies, is because they needed a past to have a future. But time... The core identity of Dasein and transcendental subjectivity is under threat by liberalism 
and the universal imposition of the end of history. So with the end of history, it is the end of time itself, both the past, the present, and the future. And thus, if this um, timeless end of history idea is imposed on the entire globe, which liberalism in the West and America are trying to do with their foreign policy constantly expanding their ideology to other parts of the world, the whole world is going to have no history. It's going to have no sense of time because we'll have reached the liberal end of history and thus um, there's no time. And, and since there's no time, there's going to be no Dasein. There's going to be no transcendental subjectivity because time is at the core of, of our authentic existence. And that's why liberalism for Dugan is fundamentally so dangerous because liberalism, the West, America, whatever you want to call it, post-liberalism, is a threat to our very core ontological existence in the world living as authentic peoples. And this is why Dugan is so passionate about having a multipolar world, why we have to have many societies that each have their own histories. And then towards the end of writing here, Dugan uh, talks about what happens if we reach the end of history globally. Uh, or we have global liberalism. What's going to happen is that we're going to, there's going to be no more Dasein. We're going to enter in, into a post humanity state or a post Dasein. And it's essentially going to be a post modern hellscape. Um, if you, it's going to be like the worst nightmares of like Jean Baudrillard and uh, Guy Debord uh, in, in their writings. Humans are going to be interchangeable from each other. He says that the individual is no longer to exist. It's just going to be the individual. It's just going to be um, like a, a sack of flesh that exists, essentially, that's interchangeable with all the other ones. And he gets into kind of some um, almost um, esoteric stuff with regards to that. It's interesting, but I don't want to go too much into it because this lecture is already going on pretty long. So the fourth political theory, it is a very interesting book. It's it's not that long, actually, but there are a couple parts which are um, uh, hard to understand or more complicated than others. There's some parts which you can you know, easily read through and other parts where, at least for me, I had to read them several times to get a, a real understanding of what Dugan is trying to say because when Dugan wants to write um, in depth and have a lot of context and nuance to what he's writing, he can really do it and he really writes it well. Um, but also, um, the way I structured this lecture is not really how the book is structured at all. Um, I don't know if this is because of how the translators and editors did the book, or if this was Dugan or whatever, but the book is kind of, um, it's written in these like standalone chapters almost, but I, in this lecture, try to make it um, in a coherent narrative. Um, but I also, I skipped out the last three chapters of the book because they aren't as important as the rest of the content is, but um, if you want to read the book, you'll find those last three chapters rather interesting as well. So uh, thank you for listening, guys.